and I am delighted to welcome everyone. I think this is going to be a really interesting and um, exciting event for us. So this is, um, I think, the fourth rendition of our Wellness, Resilience, and Survivorship seminar series, um, and I'm very delighted to um, introduce uh, what I think is an all-star panel for us. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Stephen Friedland. Um, Dr. Friedland uh, attended medical school at UC Davis and went on to residency at UCLA with a fellowship at John Hopkins. Uh, he came to Cedar sinai from Duke in 2015. And uh, at that same year, he founded the Center for Integrated Research in Cancer and Lifestyle, um, otherwise known as CIRCLE. CIRCLE currently has six full-time employees and a network of 46 members, which include 21 clinicians and 25 researchers. And CIRCLE currently has 12 open clinical trials, mainly in the areas of diet, exercise, and stress. And it covers a number of cancer types from pancreatic brain, breast, liver, and of course, prostate cancer, his specialty. Um, Dr. Friedland is also the Warshaw Robertson Lodge Family Chair in Prostate Cancer. He is the Associate Director of Education and Training for Cedar sinai Cancer. Uh, and among other things, his expertise is in the area of risk stratification, obesity, and racial disparities in prostate cancer. Steve, thank you so much for joining. I, next, I'd like to introduce uh, a, a guest for us um, all the way from New York, and she's, she's, she's graciously um, uh, joined us three time zones ahead, Dr. Irvi Shah. She's a clinical investigator and faculty on the Myeloma and Cellular Therapeutic Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering and a member of the Junior Faculty Council. She completed a fellowship in hematology oncology at Montefiore Medical Center and in cancer immunotherapy at Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy in New York. She's board certified in internal medicine and hematology and medical oncology. Um, she's here because her research is uh, focused on the area of studying the role of diet and the microbiome and other lifestyle related risk factors such as obesity and the development of multiple myeloma, as well as identifying interventions to improve outcomes for these patients. And I think it's important to know, I was very impressed in reading this, that she opened the first ever nutrition trial in uh, plasma cell disorders earlier this year, and she's currently enrolling for that study. Um, she allowed us to share that um, she is a cancer survivor herself, and so therefore she's quite passionate about this topic of helping um, her patients make wise nutritional and lifestyle choices and to raise awareness about healthy choices to prevent cancer as well. So Dr. Shaw, thank you very much, and thank you for joining. Um, and, and last, um, but certainly not least, I, I want to introduce um, our, our co-moderator, um, Alex Mack. Uh, but prior to coming to Cedars, I learned this today, she spent most of her career in the retail food industry um, and she first involved in as a director of purchasing for a $75 million fine dining restaurant group. She then went on to start an online startup dedicated to food, cookbooks, and cooking equipment. And after working with several food-based nonprofits in the course of her job, she decided that she really wanted to spend more time in health and in wellness rather than on the retail side. And she eventually made it uh, here to us in 2018 when she joined Dr. Friedland's group um, to further help grow and develop Circle. She became a certified health education specialist in 2019, and she continues her work with Circle uh, and with other initiatives including the areas of strategic planning, operations, and community outreach. So Alex, thank you much, very much for joining and for moderating this evening's event. Um, and I wanna save enough time. So for the um, group in our audience, um, we would encourage and invite you to ask questions because I know a lot of questions will come up because this is a hot topic. I know people will get very passionate about the keto or paleo side of the world and, and, and the whole foods, um, maybe perhaps more vegan side of the arena. And, and we're framing this not as a debate, but rather a discussion and a lecture and, and conversation. Um, and I promise we won't get political. Um, Alex and I will make sure of that. So um, thank you all so very much again for joining. And um, Dr. Friedland, we'll ask you to start and um, we'll moderate the questions at the end of um, your lecture and Dr. Shah's lecture. 
Great. Thanks so much, Arash. And thanks for everyone for being uh, listening. Um, let me get this. Uh, let me share this screen. And all right. So hopefully you can see the full screen now. Um, so, you know, as a rush says, this is not meant to be a debate. I mean, the title is kind of debatey beef versus broccoli. And I, I got beef, which, which to me is the easier one to defend. But it's, I, I think at the end, you'll, you'll see that Dr. Shaw and I actually probably agree on 90% on of things. And there's probably some subtle differences. And I think that's healthy, um, no pun intended, because it means that we don't necessarily know all the answers. And that's what I think both of us in my conversations are very committed to try and get those answers. I think that's the important part is there's a lot more we don't know than things that we do know. And as we start to just think about this, um, you know, the rationale for studying lifestyle, and it is studying. I mean, obviously we're clinicians, we, we give advice to patients, we discuss things, but ultimately my hope is tomorrow I'll be able to get better advice to a patient than I am today. And that's because we're doing the research. But what we do know is that two thirds of US adults are overweight and obese. And we know that obesity, which at the end of the day is you took in more calories than you burned, um, is linked with at least 14 different types of cancer. So a lot of my focus has been, how do we prevent the problems of obesity? Um, so the potential power of lifestyle modifications, if we can do this right, in theory, we can prevent cancer, so that would be great. We can certainly hopefully improve outcomes among those with cancer, improve quality of life. But I think importantly, it empowers patients. I mean, cancer treatments are prescribed by doctors. We give chemotherapy, we give radiation, we do surgery. Um, but the patient can feel very powerless just sitting there, you know, very passive. This actually allows them to do something that to take an active role in their own care. So what do we tell patients is, by and large, we tell patients we should eat healthier. And that's well and good. And the patient says, okay, what is healthier, doctor? And the honest answer is, I don't know. Um, I have some thoughts. I have some opinions. And the challenge is our strongest evidence comes from observational studies. What we've learned is observational studies are not always correct. Let me give you an example about that. So many epidemiological studies, these are studies where they just follow people. They don't actually tell them what to eat. They just follow and see who does well and who doesn't, suggested that a low-fat diet could lower the risk of having cancer. The challenge is those who eat this lower-fat diets in the real world often exercise more. They may eat more fruits and vegetables. They're health conscious. They avoid sugar. They do a lot of other things. So at the end of the day, saying low-fat is the answer we don't know. Suggestion, why don't we go and test that? So this was actually tested. This was the Women's Health Initiative, randomized almost 50,000 women to either a low-fat and vegetable diet or to make no change. And you know what they saw? Absolutely nothing. No benefit to breast cancer, no benefit to colorectal cancer, no difference in cancer overall, no benefit to even heart disease, stroke, diabetes risk. All these things that we say low fat, eat more vegetables, didn't see it. And so one of the conclusions is these epidemiological data, just following and seeing what people do is not always right. We need to understand the mechanisms by which they work. And to do that, that often requires animal studies. We need smaller intermediate endpoint driven trials. If we put people on a diet, can we change this marker and this protein and this hormone level? And then Ultimately, we need to understand how to deliver these in the real world, because perhaps, perhaps, I don't think so, my opinion, but perhaps low fat and vegetables is the right answer, but people just weren't compliant enough. And if only we could get them to, to follow the diet better, we'd see those results. So again, a lot of things. So why don't we, here are the questions that we don't have answers to, is what intervention? We're having a, a debate, quote unquote debate, beef or broccoli. At the end of the day, I think they're both healthy. Let's figure this out. What population to test? Do we test before people have cancer, 
once they have cancer, once late stage, only certain subsets, when to intervene. Again, at what time point along the way? What's the appropriate endpoint? What is the goal? You know, we know, unfortunately, a lot of the cancer, as hard as it sounds, comes from bad luck. So we can eat right, exercise, do everything perfectly. And you'll see Dr. Strasko had this. We can prevent a lot of cancers. We're not going to prevent 100% of cancers. So what can we be that's realistic as an endpoint? And then again, even if we do all this, find something that works, we find the right time, we find one interview, we know how to study it. How do you get actually people to do it in the real world? And so why don't we have these answers is because each one of those requires a different skill set, different groups of researchers that don't always talk together. So this is something that we've tried to do at Cedar sinai is to bring these people together to help answer these questions. And one approach we've done it, as Dr. Asher said, is the CIRCLE, Center for Integrated Research on Cancer and Lifestyle, really bringing people together who observe what people do, the scientists who can test in the laboratory, the clinical trialists, and all working together that we can get these answers. I want to give you a little bit of an example of this in the prostate cancer sphere. Just given the time, I can't go through all of our data, but I'm going to summarize a little bit of what we've done. These are always some of my favorite slides. And I think the concept is familiar, but it's shocking to me every time I look at these slides. And this is the rate of obesity in the United States in 1990. And what you see is in the light blue, most states were 10 to 14%. Two states were above 15%. There's actually some white states here. We didn't even know what it was in 1990. No one thought about obesity in 1990, only 30 some odd years ago. And we can see how this has changed over time. And no, these are not political maps at all, but you see here by 1997, you're starting to see some states above 20%. First state in the nation, Mississippi leading the country in 2001, above 25%. And you just see this evolution. You've got Colorado holding out there as kind of the lone state under 20%. And eventually that falls. And the rates have seemed to perhaps slow, you know, we're not showing the above 30, the above 35. The rates of obesity seem to be tapering off a little bit. Um, so that's the good news. So why is a urologist, as Dr. Asher said, someone who's in prostate cancer, why am I talking about obesity? Well, we have data, large data from the 1960s, 1980s, 90s, long time ago, that the more obese you are, the greater your risk of dying of prostate cancer. And then he said, this is not smoking and lung cancer. This is not, you know, multiple fold, but when a third of the country is obese and prostate cancer is the second most lethal cancer in men, you're getting thousands of men each year dying from prostate cancer simply because they have some excess weight. So when we look at the diet and say, what changed? Why did obesity take off? What you see here is a very nice graph that obesity rates here, this is the 1960s and 70s. We're going up, but relatively stable. Going up a little bit. All of a sudden, our government said, eat low fat. You got to eat low fat. That's the answer. And what happened is everyone out and rushed to buy low fat ice cream and all these low fat issues that had lots of sugar in them. And so sugar intake here, which had been semi-stable, you know, maybe going up a little bit, going along with obesity, all of a sudden took off. And obesity rates took off. Oh, extreme obesity took off. It all started right here. And then as people realize, hey, fat might not be as bad for you as we think. Hey, but the sugar is probably not good for you. And again, I think this is where Dr. Shaw and I are, are going to agree on things, hopefully, is that sugar is probably not good for you. So sugar intake has come down because we're realizing how bad it is. Obesity rates have actually kind of tempered a little bit. So I do seem to be, I mean, there's a lot more involved in obesity than simply sugar, but of the things in the U.S. diet, oh, sugar is the one that tracks most strongly with obesity. So what happens if we tell cancer patients don't eat sugar? So we tested that. Carbohydrate and prostate study, you see it's caps 
two. There was a caps one for the sake of time. I'm, I'm not going to tell you about that, but we got men to lose a lot of weight and their benefits with their cholesterol and they seem to have less problems with sugar and, and blood sugar, diabetes type things. They tolerate hormonal therapy better. But now we're actually testing, can we slow the rate of the tumor? So this is a randomized trial, men 20 grams of carbs per day. So anything that you think of as a carb, a, um, you know, cookies, cakes, candies, sodas, potatoes, all out, but fruit, fruit is out the table. Fruit is high in sugar. Alcohol is high in sugar. So really, again, really restrictive. And our primary outcome was PSA, which is a tumor marker in prostate cancer. It's a blood test and how quickly it would go up. How long would it take that PSA to go from one to two, two to four to double? And so we enrolled 78 men. Uh, we lost a few early on, but 57 got randomized. And most of the men here completed the study. And if anything, you see in the standard diet, which was just keep doing what you're doing, actually eight men dropped out, most often because the tumor progressed and they needed some treatment. And the low carb arm, only half the number of men dropped out. We only lost four men over the course of the study. So if you ask, what did they eat? They dropped carbohydrates from, they were about 160, 170, 180 grams a day down to about 40. Remember, we told them to eat 20 and they listened, but again, compliance was not perfect. But still, this is pretty, pretty significant. And the control arm, importantly here, didn't really change much. Because imagine you're in this trial and you tell patients, sugar's bad, we're doing the study, I think sugar makes your tumor grow faster. Oops, sorry, you actually randomized the control. Don't make any changes. Just forget everything I said. The sugar was bad. Keep eating what you're eating. And so, you know, that's the one of the challenges of doing these lifestyle trials. But we can get people to make changes or not. If, if we look at protein intake, um, the control group didn't make much change. Low carb went up a little bit, but not different. It's not like, oh, I'm not eating sugar, so I'm getting tons and tons and tons of protein. And if we look at fat, again, it went up a little bit, not significant. So it's not like it's, well, it's, you know, instead of eating that for breakfast, you know, instead of having a pancake, I can just have 10 strips of bacon and, and fat and protein and everything. It's kind of imagine your plate and you got your fruit, your, your, your meats, kind of your vegetables and your starches, they kind of took away the starch. And they'd still eat the vegetables because it's a little bit of sugar and vegetables, but pr pretty, pretty, pretty minimal. And then they would still have their meat and maybe a salad, and then you do away with the dessert type thing. That was kind of what we saw. So the question is, what does it do to the tumor? And what we saw here is the time it would take the tumor to double on this first line. And the control group was 15 months. On the low carb was 22 months. It's not significantly different. Here's a p-value of 0.3, meaning the likelihood this chance is that this difference is due to chance alone. It's about 30% likelihood of this being due to chance. But we asked how often the, actually the rate of tumor growth slowed down. And in the control arm was about 50%, which you can expect half the time it goes a little slower, half the time a little faster, not much. Three quarters of the time, we actually saw that slow down. But we also saw, it's a small study, we saw some differences between the group. So when we adjust for that, we actually saw is that this PSA, the time would take it for double, if you're in the control arm, is about a year, 13 months, and the low carb arm is two and a half years, dramatically different. So in a, we certainly didn't harm tumor growth, but if anything, it looks like we might actually slowed the tumor from growing. So if we look at some other benefits, we look at weight loss, 12 kilos versus half a kilo. So the difference here is over 11 kilos is about 23 pounds of weight loss in six months, dramatic weight loss. Cholesterol, despite what people think about low carb, eating nothing but steak and bacon and eggs, cholesterol didn't change. Your HDL, your good cholesterol went up here. Your LDL, your bad cholesterol didn't really change, maybe up a little bit, but not dramatically. Triglycerides, significantly better. And HbA1c is a measure of your sugar control, something we use in diabetic patients all the time to monitor their blood sugar and actually went down dramatically. And there's studies that show this amount of change uh, you can get by actually giving people insulin and you can actually prevent the development of diabetes 
um, in studies by even a 0.4 change. So it may not sound like a lot, but actually for HbA1c, that's a big change. And so this sounds great, but you know, you get eat all of that, the protein you want, well, what's the downside, right? You're eating this fat and, and things. People, it's gotta be bad for your heart, right? I mean, there's no free lunch, so to speak. Uh, you do get some fatigue, I will admit, early on, kind of flu-like symptoms. Uh, usually that's the first couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, seems to resolve. So we actually looked at the fatigue. And at three months, maybe a suggestion. At nine months, we didn't really see anything. Actually, if anything, a couple people in the low-carb group said their fatigue that they had actually improved. Uh, most said no change. Most of them didn't have fatigue to begin with. In decline, only one person in a low-carb study actually said their fatigue got worse. But we actually looked at people who had fatigue at the beginning. Five patients control, four in low-carb. Very, very small. It's very, very small. It's a huge grain of salt with this. But actually, in the control, nobody got better should be 100%. Nobody got better. Whereas the low carb, three out of four, 75% of people said the fatigue got better. So now we're actually looking at this as a potential to control cancer fatigue. That's something we're starting to think about. How do we design those studies? But if we look at heart disease, there's actually calculators and things online. You can plug in numbers and estimate the risk someone will develop heart disease. And at baseline, these were... And you can either do it using lipids, your cholesterol, or BMI, body mass index, your height and weight. We do it with lipid levels. You see the risk was about 20% at baseline. It goes down with low carb, not much of a change with the control. And this is kind of calculations here. If we use it by BMI, the predicted risk was about 30% before the study and dropped here to about 27, 28% with the low carb versus on the control, no change. So we think you're actually lowering the risk of developing heart disease, not just controlling tumor growth, improving cholesterol, we actually may be reducing heart disease risk. And we looked at metabolic syndrome, which is another risk factor for developing heart disease. And at the beginning of the study, about 30% of people in each group had metabolic syndrome. By the end of the study, in the low carb, it was about 10%. So dramatic differences. This is not estimated risk of metabolic syndrome. This is actually who had metabolic syndrome that we actually in 20% of our people made the metabolic syndrome go away. I'm not saying everything is perfect and they're wonderful and things, but one out of five people, you know, it went away. And if you look at the people who had metabolic syndrome, 30% had it, two thirds of those patients, it went away by just six months on the diet. So, we're trying to get more granular data on terms of the tumor and how it actually affects the growth of the tumor. So that study is in progress right now. Um, we're, we're, again, randomized low carb versus control. We now have started to offer the control group the low carb diet after the study is over because too many people have said, this diet sounds great, I want it. And so now we're saying, well, you're gonna get it, just so you're gonna get it now or like in six months from now. So otherwise, no one was interested in, in not getting this, given some of our earlier data. Um, 16 patients accrued, goal is 40. So what I can say is, in terms of obesity, the obesity prevalence is increasing. It seems to have leveled off a little bit, which is good, um, but we, we're certainly not going down. It is linked with aggressive cancers, many, many different cancers, including prostate. And what we've learned from our studies is that weight loss via low carb diet. You really, I do think you need to get the weight loss from the diet. I think that's probably the primary way it works is by losing weight is we can lower our weight, improve sugar levels and improve HDL, which is your good cholesterol. We reduce the risk of metabolic syndrome. We may actually reduce heart disease. Again, we certainly don't harm the tumor and whether it slows the tumor growth, we require further study, but our preliminary analysis just just maybe it does. But I think taking a step back in the big picture, and this is where hopefully Dr. Shaw and I, I think can agree on some things, is I am not saying low carb diet is the answer to all our problems. Don't get me wrong. It's something we have studied. I think it seems to have prostate cancer benefits. It needs to be studied. But what we know is not all diets work the same. So uh, what we've seen again is benefits to low carb in our studies that other studies did not find with low fat diets. But I think when we look across the different diets, and you're going to hear from Dr. Shaw in a minute about her uh, 
thoughts and, and things about nutrition and cancer is we try to find common ground. I, I, I believe we need to work together. I, I don't like to be antagonistic. It's not modern day politics. We, we have to work together. So what are the things that we can agree on and look at the diets out there? And I think most of them would say that we should limit sugar, limit processed foods and eat more whole foods. And you're gonna hear that I think from Dr. Sean, in terms of whole foods, I agree. I think you could be low carb whole food. And that's where, again, we may get some disagreements there, but I think some of the concepts are the same. But I think importantly, the conclusion is diet is testable. We can use science to figure out how lifestyle interventions work. And ultimately, if we had enough resources, enough funding, enough money, enough time, we could figure out the right lifestyle that improves overall health. And the trick is, it's probably gonna be a different diet for different people with different conditions and even at perhaps at different times in their life. But if we have the resources, if we have the time, we can figure this out. Science works. These are testable ideas. On that note, I would like to conclude. Thank you for your attention. And I will turn it over to Dr. Shaw and I will stop sharing here. Thanks so much, Dr. Freeland. And, and to, to our audience, I'd, I'd like you to um, hold on to your questions and feel free to put them in the chat. We'll, we'll have time at the end to wrestle with them. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna invite Dr. Shah to share her piece. I just wanna highlight one thing that Dr. Freeland mentioned that I think is very sobering. The map that he showed that showed the obesity rates, please keep in mind, it did not even show the overweight category, which arguably has some of these health risks as well. It, the, the 20, 25, 30% rates were just obese, not including that intermediate category that's considered overweight. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about that. Um, Dr. Shah, thank you again for joining us and, and um, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Asher, and thank you, Dr. Friedland. Um, I think your talk was excellent. It helped uh, give you know one context of the low carb side of things and your own research showing it. I'm gonna talk about plant forward diets and why I think that's the way to go or most important. So we at MSK have a research program studying nutrition, microbiome, and the metabolism, specifically in myeloma, but also other cancers. Um, so I personally think good nutrition for cancer is important at all stages. So, you know, when somebody has cancer and then they are in the survivorship state after they finish their chemotherapy, yes, at that time we want to, because we want to prevent future cancers, but also relapse from the same cancer. But it's also important to think about the treatment time. So if, if somebody is um, in their best health, when they do develop cancer, they're going to be able to tolerate treatment better and they're going to have fewer side effects and be able to get the right doses needed without complications. So I, I think it's important even during the treatment stage. And then when you think about prevention, so um, if prevention is to prevent cancer in the first place, but also prevent cancer after you've had the first cancer or prevent other medical problems. And so, so even though nutrition is one of the least uh, answered questions by oncologists. It's the most frequently asked question by patients, and I think rightly so. So this is just an extreme but not uncommon example of a list of medical problems. This is, um, you know, a typical, you know, myeloma patient often will see. As you can see, the list is really long with a lot of issues. And I have marked in green the issues that I think could have somewhat be mitigated by improved nutrition right early on. Now, obviously, some of this is irreversible once it's already happened. Uh, but, you know, one thing leads to the next and a lot of um, issues compound over time once a patient is in a poor health, morbid obesity with other comorbidities. And so because of this, the patient was not able to get the, all the treatments possible, and this would obviously impact survival. So basically what I'm saying is that it's not just in terms of how do you prevent the same cancer from coming back, but how do you optimize your health to get all the treatments possible to, to live longer and better. So this slide, I just wanna go over, um, you know, when we think about cancer, many times we think about, oh, these are, what can I do? I've got it because of poor genes or I've got bad genes and now there's nothing to be done about it. 
But this study is very interesting from the point of, they looked at colorectal cancer, and this was a large study of over 300,000 participants with over 2,000 cases. What they do show here is, this is a genetic risk score. So if somebody has good genes versus bad genes, so high is the bad genes. And what you can see in black is an unhealthy diet. So, and this shows you the risk of cancer. So you can see that those who have high, bad genes plus an unhealthy diet have the highest risk. But if they have bad genes and a good diet, their risk is significantly lower. It's almost similar to the intermediate risk category. So what, what this shows is that a healthy lifestyle can impact even somebody who has bad genetic profile. Now, when we talk about plant-based diets, it can be a little bit confusing as to what exactly are plant-based diets. And so I just wanted to go over in brief. So a vegan diet means absolutely no meat, fish, dairy, eggs, uh, but it doesn't have to be healthy always. Um, whereas when you look at um, a, a vegetarian diet, it, it in, includes eggs and dairy, but there is no uh, meat and fish usually. And then we talk about a whole food plant-based diet, which I think is the, the way to go if you're thinking about it for health reasons, because what this is, is minimal animal products, but it's a focus on whole foods, mainly plants, which and avoids processed foods. So I've had a patient who um, was eating only junk food, fries and everything, but was a vegan. And she said she did it for ethical reasons, but she didn't really at that time care about her health. So she was obese and also had diabetes and all of that. But that was because she was not following a healthy vegan diet, but just a vegan diet because of these reasons and not for health reasons. So I think, you know, every diet, you have to look at what you're, you know, what in the diet it is because just a vegan diet or just a keto diet doesn't mean it always is healthy. Um, another concept that's important is the concept of nutrient versus density versus calorie density. And so when you think about uh, the same number of calories in um, both the foods, it depends on uh, what kind of food you're thinking about. So nutrient dense foods are high in nutrients and low in calories and calorie dense foods are high in calories and low in nutrients. So um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, what 500 calories look like. So if you're eating a very oily diet, you know, 500 calories is not even gonna fill the stomach up, it's so little. But if you think about plants, which are high in fiber, they, they are low in calories, but high in nutrients, and they, they would actually le lead to you feeling full. So because of that, sometimes you, you don't, when you eat plant forward diets, you're eating less calories, but at the same time, you're satisfied and you don't really need to watch your calories. Now, you know, this whole thing about carbohydrates being bad, and I think they've got a bad reputation because we're thinking about refined carbohydrates. But if you think about, um, whole ca carbohydrates and unrefined carbohydrates, they have uh, important elements like fiber and other important things. So for instance, a potato, uh, which is in the French fries form versus a whole food potato have very different calorie, fat and carb. Um, and as you can see, and also the skin of the potato has a lot of healthy, um, you know, chemicals and fibers. So I think it's, it's really how you eat your potato or different uh, fruits and vegetables. So what about whole grains? So whole grains decrease the risk uh, of cancer. Um, and what you can see here is that um, this is two different studies showing that they, these are epidemiologic studies. So what they're doing is they're looking at association between um, participants and um, how many of them end up developing cancer. So they're looking at what is their overall dietary pattern and do they develop cancer? And what you do see here is that patients who eat more whole grains had lower incidence of cancer. For every three servings, there was a 15% decrease in total cancer mortality. And in this smaller study, which looked at colorectal cancer, we're seeing the same thing. So the recommended daily intake for whole grains is about 90 grams or three servings. 
um, which I think a lot of people do not meet. And we don't call white rice is not a whole grain. So whole grains are more than just fiber. And if you think about a whole grain, you have the phytoestrogens, you have zinc, selenium, copper, resistant starches, vitamins, and all of these have anti-cancer properties. They bind carcinogens, regulate blood sugar, and reduce chronic inflammation. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is this study, which is, I, I think, pretty interesting because it's looking at um, fat, fiber, and the cancer risk. What they did is they had patients who were African-American compared to rural Africans, so 20 patients in each group, and then they asked them to switch their diet for two weeks. So, and these are not cancer patients, these are healthy patients. And what they did is they, they switched the African-Americans to a rural African diet, which is high fiber, plant-based. And they switched the rural Africans to an African-American diet, which is, uh, you know, the Western diet with high fat and um, processed foods. And what they showed is that you know, a KI-67 is a marker of cell proliferation, and this marker actually went down in the African-Americans who ate a rural African diet, but it went up in those who ate the opposite diet, meaning the rural Africans who ate the African-American diet. And this is just in two weeks. Same thing with the markers of inflammation. And they also looked at a marker called butrate, which I will talk more about, but it's a, it's a good marker where you want more of it. And they saw more of it in those that were eating the rural African diet. So what about fruits and vegetables? This is again, a large study where they combined data from 14 other studies. And what they showed is that there's a 14% reduction in total cancer risk in those who eat about seven and a half servings per day or cups per day. And the USDA recommendation is also around that. The issue is that many do not meet these requirements and um, many fall short of it. So what about fiber requirements? So this is just a typical diet where I've taken you know, a Western diet and then a plant-based diet, and I'm just showing you calculations of the fiber. And what you can see is that um, the total fiber in the animal-based diet is about 20 grams, and in the plant-based diet is 75 grams. And you know the minimum requirement of daily fiber is 30 grams, so here it's not even reached in the animal-based diet. So most uh, people in the United States and world believe that they're meeting their fiber requirements, but only in reality, only in 5% meet it. And are you one of those 5%? And I think fiber is very important. Um, then when you're thinking about protein requirements, so we, you know, I think many people in the world now are protein obsessed and think about where am I getting my protein? I need more protein. And, you know, if I eat plants, I'm not getting protein, but plants actually have protein. And so I'm just, again, doing a back of the envelope calculation, showing you that uh, if you need about one gram per kilo of uh, protein, and if and that's also on the higher side, you usually need 0.8. So we're talking about 48 to 60 grams. This plant-based diet exceeds it, and so does the animal-based diet, but the animal-based diet exceeds it twice by twice. And high-protein diets are associated with kidney disease and things like that as well. So we don't want too much protein uh, because that has its other chronic medical issues. So what about um, carcinogenicity of red and processed meat? So um, this was the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, 22 scientists met in 2015 in France, and they looked at all the data available. Like they looked at 800 studies, and they put all of that together. And this largest body of evidence showed that colorectal cancer, there was an increase, 18% uh, increase per 50 grams. And then they also showed that there is some increase with pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and other cancers, as you can see. So this, this was published in one of the top medical journals showing that there is a significant association. And then how strong is the evidence based on all of that? If you think about carcinogens or cancer-causing compounds, 
There is group one means it almost certainly causes cancer. Group 2A means it probably causes. And then as you go lower down, it's less likely. So processed meats have been classified as a group one carcinogen and red meats as a group 2A. Uh, based on all this evidence. So, you know, it is very clear that there is a somewhat increased risk. And the, re the way that this risk is, there was a recent paper published this year showing that, th that there's actually a genetic signature of um, red meat consumption that sh shows up in colorectal cancer and they can tell which colorectal cancers have developed due to high amounts of red meat consumption. And this was published earlier this year, and they call it the alkylating signature. Um, so mechanisms by which meat is linked to cancer, there are multiple different ones. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but very important is that there's no fiber that alters the gut microbiome. And also it depends on how the meat is cooked because a lot of those, you know, the, the black uh, burnt edges that develop, those are advanced glycation end products, which are associated with increased cancer risk too. So again, now if we think about protein, which kind of protein do you want? The animal source or a plant source? And this again was a massive study with over 131,000 participants published in 2016. And what they show here is that they're thinking about death from any cause, death from cardiovascular disease, death from cancer or other. And they show that the, the death from, um, if you substitute the, the, any of these animal-based meats uh, with plant protein, uh, is there an increased risk or a uh, decreased risk? And consistently, it's a decreased risk across the board. And so I think plant proteins are healthier overall. Um, and I'll show you a little more evidence on that. And the same thing for cancer. So what about vegetarian diets and um, plant-based diets overall? So th there are three large studies that were published. One was from the US, one was from the UK, and one was from France. This study looked at different dietary patterns and they showed that the vegans had the least cancer compared to non-vegetarians um, and the risk was 16% less. The second study from France also showed the same thing where they scored every person's diet based on a plant-based dietary score and showed that those who have a, a, a higher score have a lower cancer risk by about 15%. And then the third study from the UK, again, classified people into different groups and then showed who had the least cancer. And again, they showed the same thing. So a plant forward dietary pattern in all these three studies was associated with reduced cancer risk. Now, what about the gut microbiome? And uh, you know that's some of the research we are doing as well, uh, but there is a lot of evidence now coming out about the gut microbiome because we are more microbiome than human. We have more microbiome cells in our bodies than we have human cells, which is quite interesting. So feeding our microbiome is very important to improve health. And um, so this study looked at feeding the microbiome and what it, it, they did is they put uh, nine patients, only nine patients on five days of a diet. One diet was a plant-based diet, completely plant-based, and the other was a completely animal-based diet. And what they showed is that obviously the fiber content increased because only plant foods have fiber, but then they showed that the butyrate levels were higher in the plant-based and the acetate levels were higher. Um, these are important chemicals made by bacteria that actually have anti-cancer effects, which I'll talk more about. Um, and then they showed that these bile salt hydrolases or these uh, the bile acids were higher in the animal-based foods, which again have increased risk with cancer. And so as you can see down here, short-chain fatty acids like the butyrates have anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory effects that have been studied. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about was food quality. And again, what I want to show you here is that dietary patterns, if you look at the healthier patterns marked in green, um, have a certain microbiome imprint where you can see there are some good bacteria and some bad bacteria. 
And then the same thing with um, the whole grains food. So the healthier diets match the plant-based foods if they look at the individual foods. And the, the animal-based diets um, are the opposite where you can see here meat, uh, animal-based foods matching the unhealthy diets in terms of the color patterns. And then the other thing is how many um, types of plant foods do you eat in a week? This study looked at diversity in over 10,000 individuals. And what it showed is that people who ate more than 30 plant foods, so different kinds of plants, not just the same broccoli every day, but different things, is associated with a healthier gut and improved um, abundance of these um, fatty acids that are associated with cancer fighting properties. So plant-based diets are actually feasible and effective based on you know, other randomized studies. These are in non-cancer populations, but you can see drop in hemoglobin A1C despite eating high carb diets, but because these are not processed, they had improvement in diabetes, improvement in weight, improvement in cholesterol. So how does a whole food plant-based diet diet work, there are many different mechanisms by which it could be working. Some of it is the increased fiber. Fiber means there's less time for the, the food to sit in the intestine and less time that it's in the intestine means that it is um, less time for it, the chemicals to actually interact with the colon mucosa and cause cancer. Then I talked to you about butyrate. So butyrate usually increases only with fiber rich foods and increase in that is, shows decrease in inflammation. We didn't talk about IGF-1, but vegans have less, have lower IGF-1 levels than um, vegetarians and um, meat eaters. So that's another mechanism. And then phytochemicals are only found in plants. Phyto means plant. And these chemicals also are associated with cancer reduction. And as Dr. Friedland alluded to or talked about the weight loss aspect, I think you see that with a plant-based diet too. So these are the American Institute of Cancer Research and World Cancer Research Fund guidelines. And as you can see, what they talk about is limiting processed foods, limiting red meat and processed meat and eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables and fruit. You can go to their website and learn more about it. So a few things that I just want to conclude with is these are the healthful nutrition habits that I think are important. Uh, when you're thinking about the food plate, this is Canada's revised food plate from 2019, which I think is very unbiased and well um, represented, where you can see that half the plate should be fruits and vegetables. A quarter of the plate is carbohydrates, which are whole grains, not refined. And then a quarter of it is protein, where it's mostly plant-based proteins. And you can see that the amount of animal-based proteins is very small. So if you calculate the total, it's almost 80 to 90% of the plate is plant-based. And we talked about all these other things in terms of the carbohydrates, the whole unrefined, and then the protein preferred plant over animal sources. and um, you can go to the American Institute of Cancer Research. They have very nice information on foods that fight cancer. If you click on each of the foods, you'll actually see information about each of them and how they do it. And as you can see, the foods that fight cancer, there's not, they're, they're all plant-based foods, not even one animal-based. And foods to limit is uh, animal proteins, refined sugars, and fat based on what they've also talked about. And then this is just important quick thing is that you should look, you should think about ingredients in terms of um, what are the ingredients in the, all bread is not the same. Look at the ingredient list. You want something with just the basic ingredients. Same thing with uh, yogurt, all yogurts, not the same. Generally, as Dr. Frieden said, um, non-fat yogurts usually are high carb or often because, or high in sodium because they, need to compensate in terms of the taste somehow. And so non-fat doesn't always mean it's healthy. So in summary, I just wanna conclude, whole food plant-based is the way to go until we have more data. And for that, you could do it whichever way you want for that last five to 10%, but the, the whole foods is um, most important. So with that, I will end and happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shaw, and then again, Dr. Friedland. And just to 
empathize with our audience. I know we can't see each other right now. Um, I, I hope we'll be able to change that in the future. I remember very well, it was about three years ago, maybe four years ago at Cedar sinai where one week, literally, we had a Grand Rounds expert come, and I, I forget his name, give a talk on the paleo diet and its benefits and had 60 minutes worth of slides about the benefits of paleo. And then literally two weeks later, um, Dr. Dean Ornish came and, and spent 60 minutes talking about the vegan diet and all the slides and benefits and, and scientific studies supporting that diet. And I remember um, there's this conflict that many of us are trying to sort out. So um, there are already some so, questions. Uh, from Rosh, it, you know, uh, one, one thought in terms of that is, yeah. so um, as you can see, I'm in my scrubs today. I am a surgeon, just my other hat. I actually have a surgery that I have to go into the hospital uh, shortly to do. And to me, it, it's the age old debate of, for prostate cancer is surgery versus radiation. And you get together with a radiation oncologist and a surgeon, they're never going to agree. And at the end of the day, both treatments work. I, I think, you know, you, yeah. you, you, you take off the, the, the makeup, you, you, you know, you're not in a public forum and you sit and you having a drink and talk, both of the approaches work. And I think that's, you know, would be my say, uh, you know, and thoughts about the different approaches. And, you know, I mean, Dr. Shaw shows some very impressive data. I think you could show similar for low carb. I think at the end of the day, obesity is probably the biggest issue and anything that promotes weight loss and gets people to lose weight, in my opinion, is going to be uh, helpful. And there's, I don't think there's one single way to, to treat cancer. There's not one single way to live. That, that's my sense. Perf perfectly said. Um, I know there's a few questions and, I, and, I, and more coming, and I have a few if there's time. And Alex may. Alex, do you want to um, start? I think there's some uh, good Q&A in, in the chat sure. already. Sure, sure. Um, so we have some people asking about uh, uh, food substitutions. So if you don't want to eat pasta, quinoa pasta, or almond bread, almond crackers, uh, those kinds of things. And I would add in there also uh, uh, plant-based meats. Are these healthy items? Are they not? How do you judge? So do you want me to take that or? Yeah, you can start. <laughs> Okay, so I, I personally think that variety is key, right? And just now in the world, what's ended up happening is we've all gone towards one grain, wheat or rice. We've gone towards one vegetable, maybe potatoes or broccoli, but there are hundreds of them. And like I showed you in terms of variety is very important. So I would say that you know, if you want to eat anything beyond wheat, you have to actually see, actively seek it out because most cakes and most breads and everything are made out of wheat. Um, so I recommend doing a little bit of different things uh, because I, I think that there is value to the variety of foods as because we are feeding different parts of the microbiome as I showed you with 30 plant foods. Um, so that's what I would say and whole grains prioritizing. So when you think about the quinoa pasta, the flour crackers or things, some of that could be refined. So you want to pick things that seem to prioritize whole grains. Somebody asked about the Ezekiel bread. I think Ezekiel bread is one of those that are actually very um, whole grain and low glycemic index. So that's, I think, a very good bread to consider amongst the ones out there. Yeah, and, and I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think, you know, putting on a low carb hat, I mean, I would much prefer people to eat almond based type things or, or quinoa over a wheat based. A lot of pasta, the standard restaurant is not going to be a whole wheat pasta. It's, it's processed foods. Um, in terms of the meat substitutes, um, under the assumption that meat is bad, which I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but nonetheless, um, we don't know that those meat substitutes are necessarily healthy. There was one study that looked at it recently that suggested perhaps, I don't think they were designed necessarily to be health foods, but they were meant to be substitutes for people who are, as Dr. Shaw talked about, the ethical vegans, necessarily than the people really doing it for health. I think the jury is still out on some of those meat substitutes. Okay, and on the same sort of strain, how about supplements? And I don't mean omega-3 or things like that, but things like collagen, whey protein, a psyllium husk, those kinds of things. They're just too many to address or how would you deal with that? 
So in general, the AICR guidelines actually say avoid supplements. That's specifically because there is an, and that was part of one of the slides, I didn't go into it, but that's because there is increased cancer risk with some supplements. So I think you have to be very careful about what you're using and if there is enough data on it. Um, I would not recommend col collagen or whey protein. I, I, I defer to you, Dr. Friedland, if you have a different opinion. But for xylem husk, I'd say that's, be, that's for people who are not getting enough fiber in their diet. So if you can get plant food and get your fiber, then that's great. You don't need the xylem husk because it's also then you're eating only one type of fiber. Again, variety is key. So if you eat different plant food, you get different fiber that feed different microbiome and bacteria. I, I would agree. I don't recommend supplements. And I think if you're eating a healthy diet, and just to clarify, low carb doesn't mean all meat. It's, it's low carb, whole food. That's what we've emphasized. Healthy meats when you do eat meats, but it includes a lot of vegetables in that, just not fruits and, and processed and, and carbs um, or, or simple carbs. Um, so if you're eating a healthy diet, whether you're listening to Dr. Shah or myself, either way, you're eating all of that. I agree. You don't need supplements. All right. Here is a very um, relevant and important question and very timely about racial bias um, in uh, uh, clinical trials. And uh, when you're assessing mostly white men or white women, how can you make those generalizations for all races? So the short answer is we can't. Um, we have tried to include black men in our studies. Our studies have not been huge numbers um, to the point where we can look at whether the black men are responding separately or not. We actually um, literally today um, submitted a, a huge, huge grant um, to the federal government, to the Department of Defense, to look at whether diets in terms of men with prostate cancer differ in black and white men. That was one of the core questions of that grant. So I would say the short answer is we don't know. And I think it's, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, to take the studies that we've done and others and say, all right, this is the diet you should have versus really taking the time, sitting with the patient, what are their preferences, what are their food tastes and how do we work with them? And I'm constantly pushing my patients to eat healthier. It's not about being perfect every single day, every single meal, but what are within their preferences, their cultural beliefs, how can we make can slow steady changes towards healthier? Yeah, I also think one, one thing is that, you know, when we talk about these overall dietary patterns, we're not, we're not, we're not talking about like specific recipes and things. So I think every culture has different foods. And the question is, how do you adapt those foods that you've grown up with to a healthier form of the same thing? And I think we need more culturally appropriate food items and discussions around that. So very true and agree with it. All right. Um, here's an individual who has been recommended a diet that they cannot follow because of their health issues. Um, how can your diet be healthy when some of the fundamental recommendations is something they can't follow? And that's where I'd say you need to personalize it. You got to work with your dietitian or whomever is helping you. And the short answer is you need to find a different diet. And I, I don't, that's where I think this idea that there is one sole way to live uh, just intuitively doesn't make sense. All right. Um, and then we have an individual asking about prior to surgery, is it, is it better to eat meat prior to surgery if um, this person is mostly vegetarian, um, but they're wondering if there's a benefit to eating meat before surgery? I would say no. I mean, if you're a vegetarian and, and you're eating healthy and you're a normal weight, um, I think that's going to be fine. I would not alter your diet acutely before surgery. Um, I've seen people are vegetarians and start eating meat and it creates problems and people eat meat and all of a sudden stop it. It creates problems in terms of changing your microbiome acutely. They're adapted to what you eat. Um, the one things we kind of do recommend uh, before surgery is to try and stop smoking. Um, if you are smoking and to try and limit alcohol to a certain degree, uh, we've had people who are alcoholics and then after surgery, they're in the hospital. We don't give them alcohol in the hospital. And we've seen uh, rarely some problems with that. 
Um, another thing is if you can lose weight, if you're overweight or obese, losing weight can make the surgery easier, technically easier and safer. Okay, and I think this might be one of the last questions, but um, someone is asking about the need to gain weight uh, with cancer-related cachexia. How, how do you manage that with, with some of the guidelines that you've discussed? So, Dr. Shaw, you're yeah. the medical oncologist. <laughs> And that's a really good question. I, I think um, that is something that I think about often too. Uh, what I do think is most important is finding foods that you like that are healthy or tolerable because many times cancer cachexia could be due to many reasons. One is it chemotherapy related nausea or is it cancer related weight loss or what, what are the reasons that are driving it? So first understanding what's driving it. And then once you know what's driving it or what the triggers are, then picking foods that work for you. So sometimes people with nausea may not be able to eat certain foods, but maybe they like the ginger foods or things like that. So figuring out what works for you. Um, I think any dietary pattern can be fit into that. But also when somebody is in an acute treatment phase, I wouldn't recommend that they suddenly try to change their diet completely because they're already stressing their body with other things. So it's more important to do something gradually that you can sustain than do something intensely for a short time that you cannot sustain. And I, and I think I actually, you know, in terms of the, the cancer, I mean, A, I agree with Dr. Shasta. I think it was very well stated. I think, you know, we've seen data, for example, in patients undergoing radiation therapy. For example, part of the way radiation works is by creating oxidants. That's how it kills the tumor cells. So we've actually seen data that people take antioxidant supplements. Actually, radiation doesn't work as well. And that's where, I mean, I think we need to be cautious about making acute changes of things and adding medicines and changing lifestyles acutely in the middle of cancer therapy. Um, it needs to be done carefully with working with your physicians, working with ideally a, a dietitian. You know, again, there are some common things I think we can do, but you know, you gotta be careful in the middle of treatment because you can have the nausea from chemotherapy and, and you need to eat more, not less. You know I mean? It's, 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 and that's the challenge is every body's different and every body is different. And to be sensitive to time, Alex, maybe we'll just take one more question um, and then we'll we'll wrap up and, and hopefully maybe revisit this in, a, in the future. Great. So, uh, well, I think lastly, we, our audience is wondering if they can have access to the presentations. And I, I don't know how you guys feel about that. So I thought, thought that should be the last question, perhaps. On with me. Absolutely. Sure. So we will be happy to distribute it um, within uh, our administrative team. Um, I want to once again, uh, again, thank Dr. Shah. Thank you for uh, staying up late in New York and taking time for joining us. Uh, Dr. Freeland, again, thanks for joining. Alex, thank you for moderating. And uh, a lot of work goes from our administrative team, from uh, Lisette and the gang to organize all this. So I thank everyone. And I hope uh, to see you for our next seminar um, probably being scheduled in the next two, three months. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.